Good morning, everybody. In fact, uh, in the light of goods and services tax being introduced, many of the businessmen or the professional are getting insight into lot of indirect taxes which used to be not there earlier. Do you agree or not? Now, having understood little more than what used to be in the context of indirect taxes, now the concerned officers of any organization or the professionals are also now getting into understanding of other aspects related to these indirect taxes. In that context, if you see, is one of them is this foreign trade policy, benefits, EOU, SEZs. If you had asked the same, some of the concepts of the foreign trade policy or the EOU or SEZ for the same officers one and a half years back, they would have no, I don't know, I think that is something totally which we should not be knowing. We are not interested in knowing because it is related to indirect tax. But having got into the concept of GST, understanding that, I think it becomes imperative now for us to also understand the connected aspects like a foreign trade policy and also similarly the customs. So are we expanding our arena into a different, different thing? Answer is yes then other way likely are we putting up more responsibilities on our head? Answer is yes. If we are not, we can't be surviving because the order of the day, whatever the technology today is, if we are not updated, we are outdated within a short period of time. Similarly, with lot of development which is happening in the business scenario, in the commercial field and also the professionals who are engaged in the business as well as the of people who are administering and monitoring or managing a financial affairs of an organization or the taxation and compliance are now forced to get into all this aspect because you cannot de-link each one of this. Earlier if you had asked VAT, sir I know VAT but don't ask me about central excise. Okay, sir, if I ask somebody who knows excise, sir, I know excise and other things, don't ask me about sales tax. Okay, I know about sales tax, but don't ask me about service tax. So, if you are asked about service tax, yes, sir, I don't, sir. Foreign, sir, what is foreign trade policy? So, you are getting incentives, sir, there is not some consultant comes and does, I have no idea. But today is not that, we have to uh, increase or expand our of I mean, understanding in all these things because it are, these are interconnected. In this background, uh, when we have designed this entire program, the special focus is given as to what is the benefits any business can take in EOU, foreign trade policy, respite taxes, what was the scheme, all these things. Also, we thought there should be one topic which gives the fundamentals for all these things. One is okay, operational are the built, but what is the foundation of all these things? If we are no clear about our concepts, it becomes easier for us to understand the further things better. So, the topic which I am going to take up is more to deal with the conceptual principles or fundamentals which we have to keep in our mind as to the context of GST and the corresponding incentives. Though in the brochure, one of the aspects which is not so specifically dealt is also included for uh, the benefit of explaining you the concept of this refund as well. If you see the concept of destination based principle in goods and service tax, which is a principle which we all have heard about it. But effectively what it means, how it operates, why it is required internationally, what is the importance of it and the background of refunds. So this is how we are designed and incentives 
uh, in India for exporters. I will briefly deal with it because other topic, I mean other speakers are in detail are going to deal with uh, all of that. We all know the purpose of uh, GST being the levy on final consumption, stage collection process. I don't want to but just to have the uh, background running. It uh, lays on the core VAT principles. We call it as GST, but it is actually value added tax. Since we had already adopted this nomenclature of VAT for sales tax law, we didn't want it to repeat that and say, no, no, this is different VAT. So we nomenclature or we had a different name called a GST. Internationally, it is called as VAT. Okay. Even uh, the latest countries, we and all when they introduce, they call it as a VAT, not a GSC. So in India, we are calling it as a GST. So don't get it confused. That is different, this is different. So the principally, it is the same. When it comes to origin-based, destination-based concept, you all know origin-based means the tax is collected where the supply originates. It is not only collection, the revenue which is collected at the origin goes to the exchequer of the concerned government from where the supply got initiated. <coughs> so that is more important. It is not the collection point. Who is entitled to enjoy the proceeds of the tax? The government which is entitled to enjoy the proceeds of the tax is was the place where the supply originated. In fact, generally, I always try to explain this. Say in Bangalore, you have set up a factory to manufacture cars. So all the cars which get manufactured here, the taxes were being paid in Karnataka for the interstate supplies from Karnataka to other states. So whatever the CST which was collected in Bangalore in, by Karnataka government, that was an entitlement for Karnataka government to enjoy and spend. Whereas in the destination based principle, though the tax, you may be registered here, you may remit a tax, but the tax effectively transferred to the government to which the goods are ultimately transferred. So that is a prime difference. Now, having explained this, we have moved in the GST obviously for a destination based principle. In India, in the past, we were all essentially following origin based taxation. However, for the purpose of international transaction, we were adopting destination based principle. How is it? Now you are exporting some goods from India. Where did the goods originated from? India. Where was it going to? Whatever, whichever the country. Say US or UK or Middle East, any of the countries. So what they said? Since it is going that the taxes, if any, has to be collected by that government, it should not be collected by the origin government, that is Indian government. So they said in any transaction of an international nature, the taxes has to be finally collected by the country where the goods are being received and consumed. So, where whatever the taxes collected on that goods has to be given back because that country will collect a tax on it on importation into that country. So therefore, if we also levy tax, they also levy tax, it will be a double time tax on the same goods. So they said effectively as an international principle, the taxes should be a destination based principle. So therefore, we have to 
not tax and the tax should be only be levied and collected by the destination country. So in that concept, the principle got emerged, which we know the principle. What is the principle? We should only export goods and services, but not the taxes on goods and services. Clear? In order to achieve this objective, there used to be a different methodology which was being followed. So the background or the principle is, when any goods are getting exported, that should not have any tax element on it. So when I am telling any tax element, it is much more wider connotation than merely whatever the tax I need to pay on that particular goods, it also include within its ambit whatever the taxes I have paid on my procurements, purchases, costs to bring that particular goods to a particular stage. So it is not only output tax which I mean, it also includes a input tax. So there has to be a mechanism which has to achieve this object. So how will this be achieved? Okay, when you are selling your goods from India to abroad, you will not charge tax on that goods, fine. But what happens to the taxes already incurred by you on the raw materials and the goods and services received by you and consumed over that? So they have to give you that also refund. I mean, give back. So there are different mechanics which was there in the past, which they were enabling you to get that. One, this whatever Jatinsa was explaining in the morning session, there are two methodologies. One methodology is, you have got an accumulation because you are exporting. So, you have to take that credit and go for a refund. Before that stage, first of all, you should be entitled for the credit because since you are not paying any tax on exportation, the, it is in part with an exempted goods, correct? Once you are relaxed on payment of tax, it is in par with a exempted goods. Once it is an exempted goods, what are the general principles? You are not entitled for input tax credit. So they had to create a third category, taxable goods, I mean basically where you pay tax, exempted, third category which as a characteristic of an exempted for the output side but for the input side as a characteristic of a taxable goods because so that is called as a zero rated. So that is the difference between a zero rated which is exempt. Exempt is concerned, you will not pay tax, you are not eligible for inputs. Taxable, you pay tax, you get a input tax. This zero rated in between has got tilt like this. Output is as nature of a exempted, input side is the nature of a taxable. So you get an input tax but you will not pay the tax. So what you do, effectively they have reimbursed back. They have reimbursed all the taxes to you by allowing you to take a credit. Right? So now you have been permitted to take an input tax. If you can utilize, fine. If you cannot utilize, that is where the refund scheme comes into picture. There again if you can use that refund mechanism or go. Now there was a challenge which was that if exempted goods, final product itself is normally exempted. It is not a taxable item at all. But you are exporting that exempted goods. Still, can it be considered as a eligible? They said, since it is a third category, do not see whether it belongs to the exempted category in original or taxable category in original. But if it is getting exported, 
even though it is an exempted item per se if you sell it domestically, whatever the corresponding inputs you are eligible for return. So again, the concept back to the thing, the taxes cannot be exported. So taxes they want to give refund. So whatever may be the nature of goods, once it is going out of the country, the general principle is you should get back the corresponding taxes paid on the inward side. All other schemes, it may be EOU scheme, it may be your advance authorization or DFIA, all these are duty remission scheme. What is duty remission? You are relaxed from payment of tax. So, people said, sir, why are you asking me to first pay tax and then allow me to take a refund or claim back? Give me a relaxation the threshold because I am anyhow exporting. That is where the EOU scheme came in. EOU scheme permits was designed saying that you have to, you can procure all what is required to be manufactured in a EOU to be exported out of the country. All the taxes which you are supposed to pay, you have been given relaxation, subject to the condition that you are used for the production, input, output, now blah, 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 blah. So that is the, again, a principle where goes back to the same principle why the EOU scheme was designed. Similarly, advanced authorization and want to import certain goods to be used in the manufacture of a goods to be exported out of the country. So there again they said, why I have to pay customs duty, why I have to pay CV in the past and now GST, permit me to import without pay any, pay any of them, I will keep it in proper account of all these items and subsequently I will export whatever the goods I manufacture and fulfill my obligation thereby I fulfill the government's mandate that no taxes are exported and also benefited. So these are the certain things, sir I can't do this in advance, first I will do whatever out of my in. So I already have a duty paid stock. I will use that and manufacture goods and export first. I know what is my input output ratio. Based on that, I will ask you. You will give me a authorization DFI where I am permitted to import that much quantity in future. So that is a post export uh, remission schemes. So this is a different incentives <coughs> which were there nullifying the impact of taxes. I'll come back to this. I'll go back a little to the destination based principle which I was explaining. Now these are all what is happening at a origin point. Come to the destination point. So what is the destination point there, that country on importation they have to collect tax on that particular goods. Always Please note, the customs duty is a different tax element than the value added tax. Okay? So, when any goods gets into that country, that respective country will say, was well, now I am entitled to levy tax on this particular goods. That is where on importation that value added tax is also added in addition to the customs duty. The origin country relax the tax payment, but the destination company will come and say, okay, it's now my territory, it's now my jurisdiction, it is now my uh, prerogative to tax it, so I am going to levy and collect tax. Goods here, so on the importation, they add the tax. Converse of it, if any goods which is coming from any other country, that is where the customs duty is imposed in addition to customs duty, IGST is being levied and collected. Somebody asked me a question. 
Sir, why all this headache of two, three elements? Can't they include or increase the custom duty rate? Why all this two, two rate? <coughs> it is not so because this element is wattable. That is available for set off. Whereas customs duty is not. Customs duty adds to the cost. So they cannot, so this has to be a separate. In fact, that is the reason there used to be a separate, separate element, even SAD. That has a separate characteristic in itself. You cannot, though it is having a nature of the customs duty, they need to have this segregation among them because each of them are separately dealt in the respective domestic territory. So they have to deal with accordingly. So it is very easy for any of us to identify this concept in the context of goods, physically available, physically tangible. So we can identify this coming. It has a physical control mechanism through a, a customs port. But what happens to the services? That is where the challenge comes in. Okay. Now the challenge when it comes, how are we going to identify uh, whether the service is imported or exported? That is where internationally a concept got emerged which is called a place of supply. In my subsequent slides it is there. I am not going according to the slide but it is there in subsequent slides. So the place of supply gets emerged where internationally they try to keep a harmonization as far as possible that in these type of services the place of supply shall be treated as so and so to tell an example in case of any property any service directly related to property like construction architecture real estate agent services Internationally, the principle is wherever the property is located, that is the place of supply. Say for example, I am in India. I am designing an architecture for ITC who is in India. But this project is supposed to come in Dubai. So where is the place of supply? Why I took this example is, this is a principal set, but however, it is clearly said, each domestic, that is each country has got a discretion to alter this. So where an extra thing which has come in, where if the supplier is located here, recipient is also located here, but the place of supply is outside, the place of supply shall be deemed to be in the recipient's place. In the service tax, they said provide a recipient both within the uh, taxable territory, it is the recipient place. GST also similar concept is there. So though these principles are set, each country has got a discretion to modify to some extent depending upon their respective countries norms which are there. For example, intermediary which we have adopted in our country, we have adopted for an intermediary place of supplies where the supplier is located. But that is not an international practice per se. So we have adopted it, so it cannot be current. So that is where there may be a distortion for some of the services where the taxes are being collected in both countries or at the same time it is not being taxed in both the countries. So, in fact, there is always a residuary clause which was then service tax. Now, central government could now could have come out with a notification and in some circumstances where it is being doubly taxed or not taxed, they had the power to come and notify and say the place of supply is going to be a place where the effective utilization of that particular services. Only it will be on representation it could have been done per se. So this is how the concept of place of supply vis-a-vis -vis the 
destination based principle. Now, with this basic background, I'll run through the how it is connected to a refund relating especially to exports. Exports are not tax ends, we have to go for refund of input tax credit because we will otherwise get accumulated. I mean, the credits get accumulated. In fact, uh, it attains a neutrality concept, net neutrality. What is this net, tax net neutrality? Though I pay gross higher amount, considering the impact of the refunds and the benefits taken care, there will be a tax neutrality. Both the situations should be equal from a businessman's perspective. It should not be a discriminative or distorted. So that principle has to be achieved when you are designing a law is what the international guidelines do say on this. Exports are treated as zero rated, I explained already. Next, uh, <coughs> as I explained, the imports are taxed as well like a domestic. That is where the concept of reverse charge for services do come. As I explained, in a case of importation, the basic custom duty, in addition to basic custom duty, the GST at the time of importation they do collect. But for services, the concept of import of services, which is under reverse charge, comes into picture. At this point in time, I would like to uh, emphasize one of the major aspect which always create confusion and no clarity in the minds of the businessman is a transaction between a locations of the same entity in different countries. I have a head office in India, branch office in say Washington or wherever it is or London or vice versa. Head office there, branch office here. First I will take an example. If any goods which is shipped out from head office in London to a branch office in India, are we not going to pay GST in addition to customs duty? Yes. Okay. For services, why not is a department's question. I repeat, if you are paying tax on a reverse, I mean on an importation, on any goods belonging to the same entity from different country into India, why not in case of a services received from a head office to its branch in India, because there it is going out, it is coming into India. That is where the they have created a notional fiction of and in the establishment located outside India of a same as which is the establishment of a two distinct person. Explanation to section 8 in the IGST Act. Okay. Similarly, section 25 for the within the country thing. So this is where the concept of the intra, that is the multi international uh, establishments are coming into picture. On the one hand, they are saying when you receive, it is a different entity of the pay tax, but on the converse, when you are here, you provide any services to another location, either head office or branch of yours internationally. As per the GST law, they are not treating them as a distinct person for the purpose of exports. Importation they are treating and they ask us to pay tax, but for exportation they are not ready to, which is against the principle which is set out on this. Services, I am telling you. Goods, no problem. I am talking about services. Okay. So, 
because the condition for export of services, one of the conditions is it should not be a distinct person contained over there. So that is where the challenge lies for any person, whether it can be now, uh, should I convert all my branches into holding and subsidiary? If holding and subsidiary, it is export. If it is a branch head office, no export. So many of them have started changing this particular proposition because this is, this should have an address by the lawmakers, but I don't know why. That means they should either give an exemption for import of services or relaxation or they should consider this export then level playing field. You cannot say, I put a task, Ed, I win, to tail, you lose. Both annually remain. Okay, so that should not be the proposition which we have to be uh, looking into. And at the uh, same time, this particular uh, uh, the foreign currency concept which is there, it is applicable only for services, not for goods, as it stands presently. The condition for export is a physical movement out of the country for goods. For services, one of the condition is the seat of money in convertible foreign exchange. But that is not for goods, okay, as it stands. But I was given to told that they are examining the possibility of putting this condition of foreign currency even for export of goods also. So, but anyway, I think hitherto it was not there till now. So, we will have to see how it works. Importation I uh, explained already. Uh, imports, yes, fine. Place of supply, I explained the, the international guidelines is what is being said and however I need not I mean, I mean, the government of India, uh, when they are designing the rules, they need not adopt the same according. Again, it's not a government of India, it should be parliament because place of supply has to be defined by the parliament through a legislature made in the parliament as for the constitution. So therefore, they cannot do the place of supply through the rules, it should be through enactment only. I explained already. Okay. Now, leaving this for a time being on a export and import, I will summarize different type of refunds available, principles relating to that refund, and what are all the precautions we need to take in the context of refund. What is the meaning of the term refund? Hmm? Fund, fund, fund paid back. given back, fund, return back. So the fund, I have funded you, you are refunding me. So I have given to you, you are giving it back to me. Refund in the GST law, I don't know how many of you have read the GST law in the context of refund, it does not say, it does not set out all the circumstances in which you are entitled for refund. It says when you claim a refund, what you have to do it says. But it doesn't say in what are all the circumstances you are entitled for refund whatever the section. Essentially, when you are wrongly paid a tax, it doesn't say. Only you are It's all a already assumed and presumed proposition. If anything which you are not legally required to have paid, but you have paid, you have an inherent right of claiming a refund. So once you are claiming a refund, they have put a certain <coughs> conditions, procedures, restrictions and limitations. What are all those conditions, procedures I am not getting into, conditions, essential conditions, 
So I paid wrongly tax in 17 years back. I want to go and claim a refund. Can I do that? I have given you a loan, I think, do you remember? Eight years back, give me back. Can I ask like that? I can ask, but he is obligated to pay. Why? I don't remember it. No, I remember, I will show you your signed letter. I have got a proof that I have given, I will show you through a check. But legally, can I put a case against you? Limitation. Limitation, because there is a general limitation which comes out and say any debts etc. beyond three years unless acknowledged is cannot be recovered. If that is the case, taxes, you have paid some tax into government's exchequer which you should not have paid. Now can I go and claim that back? Yes, but is there a time limit? Sir, you said just now, three years will apply that. That is there in the General Limitation Act. But there, there is a specific provision which says, if any special law dealing with the limitation, the special law will prevail over this particular limitation. So, thereby, we have to see GST. <coughs> Earlier it was, our Central Excise Act, which was dealing with excise as well as service tax law, now in the GST law. Earlier it was one year, now two years. Having said this, one year and two years, when you go to transitional provisions, in some places they have said you are entitled for claiming a refund of old taxes with the old authorities. There it says, notwithstanding anything contained in the respective law, except, especially excise subsection 11b, except subsection 2, what are sub clauses. What does that mean? Which means that time limit prescribed there is not applicable. There is one more concept we will explain a little later, but the time limit concept is not applicable for such type of claims where there is a specific provisions contained in the transitional provisions. So some refund claims which you are supposed to have claimed in the rest of the law, which you are not claimed but entitled to claim, I think you can use the transitional provisions to that effect. So you can note down this. Now, sir, any of this is not standing 11B. For your information, that doesn't mean that you can go after 5 years and claim. The department may try to say, no, since there is no specific thing, I will try to invoke 3 years. So try to keep at least within three years, as far as possible, if we can defend, but to be on a safer side, try to make it within three years for the transitional related issue. This is one concept of time limit. And uh, sir, I was, I met with an accident the last three months when the due date was coming, so I couldn't file, I was in a hospital, so I couldn't file a refund. Can they give a condonation? No provision for condonation in any provision. Only remedy in such circumstances is you can make an attempt filing a writ or the, the High Court asking them to exercise an extraordinary writ jurisdiction to waive such condition and accept in the special circumstances which most unlikely that they will accept. In special circumstances, you can convince them the situation and try to give. Otherwise, it cannot be within the framework of law by any authorities. So, limitation is very, very harsh. So, you should be very careful as far as the refund claims are concerned. As it is in the past, we are fighting for the accumulated credit, what is the time limit, whether the cutoff date, those are still going on. So, limitation is the one important point you need to keep in mind. 
one more concept is concept of unjust enrichment what is this unjust enrichment what are the taxes we are talking about refund okay refund means refund refund of what taxes so called taxes okay because once it is not payable it is doesn't attain the characteristic of a tax so that's a different thing but it is intended it is tentative to be indirect tax what is indirect tax collected from somebody else. supposed to have collected it is not necessary to have collected supposed to have collected from your customer and remitted to the government now once you are remitting something as a tax the general presumption is you would have put your hand into somebody else's pocket taken the money and paid it to government exchequer now when you claim a refund if government gives you a refund it comes to your pocket and now you are going to put back to that other person's pocket so therefore if you are given a refund you are unjustly enriched you have been benefited which is not fair so therefore you have to establish in any refund claims that unless you establish the fact that you have not collected these taxes from anybody else not customer anybody else so you have no choice i mean you are unless you prove you will not be given to you does that mean the government will keep by himself no they have to sanction the refund but instead of paying it to you they should put it into a consumer welfare fund so that is the mechanics having said this though this principle apply for refunds but this principle does not apply for export of goods or export of services there is an exception to it in the law so somebody says that you prove me in with a documentary evidence that you are not passed on incidents in case of export you can say that section clearly give a relaxation from this thing right? so therefore you need not ask me that is a very important point which i wanted to tell you for which i explained the unjust enrichment concept okay so whether you charge you did not charge you include in the price not include in the price for the exports is not all relevant factor but ideally it is suggested better not to charge so do not have a dispute because go back to earlier supreme court one of the supreme court decision said even before this concept was introduced the principle was there the concept was there so as a fairness you should not collect and also get it sir so having explained this concept i want to also explain one more concept i gave an example that i am going to put my hands into somebody's else pocket and remit it to government now i will give an undertaking saying that no 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 now you said this so i once i get it surely i will put back into his pocket so please give me a refund can i say so why if no people are speaking there no why because that fellow would have again put his hand into somebody else's pocket and taken that money now if i give it to him he is unjustly enriched that is where the concept of credit note they say even if you have issued a credit note to your customer that will not be a sufficient proof or a evidence to say that you have not passed on the incidents of tax in fact recent supreme court decision in case of addisons did say that you have established in the last leg like where it has not been collected by anybody else then only you will get a refund so the unjust enrichment concept so effectively it's very difficult in a domestic transaction in tax pay to the government to get collected but there are some exceptional rules say that i paid a tax on investigation obviously my transaction happened earlier 
So this is a post facto, it should be written as deposit. So this principle doesn't apply. But some few decisions have come and said, no, no, it applies there also, there's a concrete use. One more thing is that always they do see, show me your financial statements. How have you shown this refund claim in your financial statements? Is it shown as a current assets receivable or <coughs> charged to profit and loss account? If you are charged to profit and loss account, that means you have included in your costing and effectively collected it from somebody else. No, so it is a post facto transaction. No, no, I don't understand all those things. Since you are charged to profit and loss account, you are supposed to not get a refund because you have passed on the incidence of tax. So when any such refunds are being claimed, better park it in a current assets, in the financials. Even if you are charging it off, charge it off with a proper note saying that this is being debited for accounting purposes only but not being charged or being included in the cost. There should be specific note coming in the financial statements if you are claiming the refund. So this is one more concept of refund leading to the register. Now having said this, is all extra paid taxes. Next comes the these type of refunds which is given as an incentives or benefits like export related refund. So also export related refund as uh, well explained in the morning session by Jatin that one way is you utilize if you are not able to utilize what we are going to do is we are going to give you the accumulated refund. So there procedurally lot of hassles are there which I have couple of slides later which we will deal with it. So, but nevertheless the government is working hard presently to enable this refund mechanism to go faster. And also to explain even the past before GSC also there was a substantial pressure which was built into the departmental officers to clear all the pending refunds. The mandate was clear, though whatever the operational difficulties were there at the down the level, but nevertheless the message was clear, the refund should be given. I think 80% uh, of the people got a refund without much of a difficulties. 20% did have a difficulties where they had to go there and get process it and all those things which uh, uh, now coming into, I think this is all uh, I explained the thing. There is also one more concept of refund which has been evolved now internationally. Wherever the tourists come and incur certain taxes in the country, they say they also to be given refund of the taxes paid in the country wherever he goes. Then please keep in mind that it is not that taxes paid, all the taxes paid by the foreign tourists in India is entitled for refund. It is only in respect of the goods which is carrying along with him at the time of going out. Because otherwise if he has received and consumed in India, why he should be given a refund? It's only something which is carrying along with it. Then there is a deemed fiction that even a transaction is at the for intrastate. In these type of circumstances, they should charge IGST only because whatever that IGST charge, he can go because central, that's a, a customs is been handled by central. So they can refund that particular thing. Now if a person do not claim, then isn't it the state losing? My question to you is, if I, I charge as IGST, okay, if that person, whoever is purchased the goods in Bangalore itself, some handicraft, 
but he did not claim refund. I gave my IJC noise. Will Karnataka lose? Hmm? No. Even if I charge IGST, the place of supply I am going to mention it as a Karnataka only. So effectively that particular revenue will get accrued, that state portion, anyhow to Karnataka. It's only the procedural enabling system, not the conceptually doesn't get diverted. The nature, because it doesn't go to sit into any other state per se. Okay. So these are some practical difficulties. I think Prashant Bhatt also is going to deal with it a little later. I am going to create an issue and he is going to resolve those issues. There is a first say refund. It is like you know putting money into Tirupati Bundi. It is difficult. First of all not possible. You want to get means you have to, it's very very difficult or not possible because firstly they say limitation, second unjust enrichment and third documentation and also they say it's all these challenges which will be there. And sorry, in between I missed out one point, uh, refund when I told, not the taxes it should not have been paid but paid, I have paid a tax. I have collected the tax from you, I have remitted to government. This tax was not payable. Is it that only I can go and claim refund or also that you can also go and claim refund? Who has to file refund? I have charged you tax, collected tax from you and remitted to government. If I go and claim a refund, they say, boss, you have passed on. So they will not give refund. Whether you can claim refund, answer is yes. Even a buyer of a goods or a receiver of a service which was not liable to have been charged, not liable to have been paid, is also entitled for a <coughs> refund claim. So then I say, I, in fact in this context, all the individual flat buyers at that time there was a dispute whether the flat construction was liable for tax. The taxes were collected by the buyers and remitted by the builder to the government. So there the buy flat, buyers of the flat claimed a refund and it was sanctioned subject to limitation. Many of them were beyond limitation so they lost. Whoever was filed within the period of limitation, they got those refunds. So this is uh, one more aspect you can keep in mind. Sometimes uh, in the business, it so happens that my supplier is strong, I cannot guide, I cannot direct, I cannot uh, tell anything to my supplier, he is too big. I know that this goods is not liable for tax or the service is not liable for tax. So you need not worry, you can pay it and you can claim a refund to that effect. Second, I explained the concept of limitation. Pre-GST law, there was, I told limitation was there, but limitation was not applicable if it was paid under protest. But in the GST law, there is no concept of this extension of time of refund of two years paid under protest. So any tax you have paid mistakenly, if you are not, whether you willingly, not willingly, once you have paid a tax, if you have not claimed it back within two years, you are going to lose that particular refund. So whether you have return letter, not return letter, that doesn't make any difference because they have not given this exception specifically. So be careful. Even though you feel that uh, the issue is not settled, file an application. File a refund application and wait for it. Say that issue is not settled, so let this be kept pending. But you should make an application, take a proper acknowledgement with proper documents being submitted over that. So this is also one more important concept you need to keep in mind as far as the refunds are concerned. So first one they say the general thing is, it is once gone, they will be difficult to get. So that is where lot of challenges do come. 
In fact, it is not really true, especially with the digesting, where you need to have a proper documentation, proper system, the principle, whatever I said, those should be clear and it should be clear, then nobody can question. Okay? In fact, a uh, few client came uh, uh, last week and said, Sir, we have considered all this transitional credit, we are eligible for a refund and passed on the benefit to customer. Will I get or not, sir? Otherwise, I will be incurring a huge loss. Now, when you are designing a costing for exports, you would have said, okay, semi-credit is not a cost. But subsequently, for any technical reason, if you are not entitled for, that means it adds to the cost and adds to the cash outflow. So, these are the challenges that you need to be very, very careful upon. So, once you are designed with the presumption that has some conditions and action which is required, never forget to go with the action. Next is, uh, it involves obviously the time, cost, effort. So you should not only con consider the amount, you should give some discount of the amount to be received towards the cost because it involves the time and effort and cost. Presently, deficiency in the system, now I think they are trying to address those deficiencies in the system so that the refunds are processed faster. But our, our experience says this will not run longer. The reason is this, my personal opinion, not generalized. Once they try to relax something, the businessmen try to take a disadvantage and misuse the facility. Somebody who is not really entitled will claim huge claim, claim refunds. So, for that small set of people to control, everybody will be put with the additional conditions and additional burdens. So, gradually they will add one by one by one by checks and balances. And the checks and balances will become a hurdles for a fast processing of a refund and likely that it will go. So, unless the industry also supports by not taking undue benefits, can ensure that the things flow smoother without much of a difficulty. In fact, uh, refunds which were of almost 10 to 12 years. Some of them we received last year, some of them is yet to be received. 10 years blockage of fund or accounting norms, all your norms says that write off. So, effectively, it is not there because these are initially. So, that should not happen in the GSC. That is what is the expectation of here. Though they have said within so and so time we should process, but generally it is delayed because they say wherever possible it shall be processed within such and such period. When they say wherever, that becomes important word than the time period which is uh, prescribed over that. The challenges which are faced in the past is a documentary, cumbersome and time consuming. How are they addressing in GST? Online. Checks and balances are coming through automatic uh, reporting process. Your shipping bills are getting reported there, there and that is being linked to the your returns being filed. So they are trying to overcome this first. Substantial cost for taxpayers. They are using because once it is automatically done, Today, uh, out of the two processes which Jatin explained, one is payment of tax on the exports with service, another is on the accumulated credits. The payment of tax and claim refund is an automatic process where your account is credited with the amount. So, 
just like a duty drawback many of the experts would have felt it is that process and uh, there were initially hiccups people are getting credits into the bank account their surplus from where the money is coming from now nobody had a clue what is the amount which is coming in it is leading to which export shipment which shipping bill if you go and ask the custom custom department say i don't know if you are going to ask the banker banker says sir we don't know it is automatic credit i go and ask the jurisdiction office they say i don't know so it was enabling without proper methodology was again a confusion because i am really intended for one crore I have got only 30 lakhs. What happened to my 70 lakhs? Whom should I go and ask? Should I what? Is there any order? If the order is there, whether should I file an appeal? So these were the issues which were not addressed. I think wasn't the I mean Prashant but has to uh, address this. How to practically take a solution for this type of uh, things? Where to go and talk and how to resolve this issue? once the refund is rejected it only leads to litigation and uh, please note in the normal course of litigation i file a appeal when the commissioner appeal says i got relief i need not do further but in case of a refund once the higher forum passes an order again a holding that order should come back to the lower authority and say that boss there is an order now based on this you pass this Give me a refund. Then he will find again if that order doesn't have a proper wording. This thing, no, no, they are told only this. They are not told this, so I am not going to give this. So this is going to be again a lengthy process to and fro. In fact, in refund processes, there are cases where five times it has gone to trial and come back. You file, he goes and say, you examine limitation based on this case law. He comes, he says. the case law is distinguishable to the facts of this case again you go to the tribunal and they say ha ah, no 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 you are wrong this case is applicable so you decide i said before the tribunal my lords you also give me a findings on other aspects no no he has not dealt with other factors so i cannot give any findings on those things so i get a limitation come back he says okay limitation agreed you there is no input output nexus he rejects Then I go again to the higher up forum. He says, "No, no, these are all you need not uh, establish nexus is eligible." So you go. Then he says, "No, the documentation invoice is not correct. Invoice is uh, containing uh, some errors. It is not addressed to the registered premises, etc." Then you go back again. Registered address is not required for input services. You get a trigger and uh, come back. You get. So in these courses, well, how much time and efforts were getting consumed? so that is where in the gst we are expecting these hazards will be not reduced and not is not going to be there it is expected to be reduced out of the past learning from other countries uh, we uh, are uh, uh, we can learn because most of the countries have fixed time limit easy mechanism in fact whatever system we are presently being adopting are more or less taken from other international practices itself but only challenge lies how it is going to be implemented in a country like us which is vast having divergent business practices divergent documentation process whether it is able to address all of them is what is a major challenge we have to say the one more important point is okay i am entitled to a refund the government kept my money for so long i am not entitled for refund of in i am entitled for payment of interest always they say government money is much more valuable than citizen i repeat The value, the value of the government money is much more than the value of the public money, because the interest what you pay to government for delayed payment is much higher than what interest they pay for the delayed refunds. Okay, 
Nevertheless, that it should be in parity, but it is not factually. I mean, law wise, it is distinction is always that. The second point is, I told you an example, a case going five times up and down, and finally sanction refund after six years. Interest is payable is what the law provides for. But from when the interest is to be paid? Is it from the day when I filed my first application or when the sanction the refund at the end? Sanction the refund. No. There's a three months. The three months time period will be there from the date of application. Within three months they should have, if they are not three beyond three months, the interest clock stop start ticking. Irrespective of the fact the matter went to litigation, there was a documentation not furnished, blah blah blah, whatever reason, it should be, it is said that interest is payable from that day till the date the refund is sanctioned. Supreme Court ran back the decision as clearly dealt in this and have said that interest has to be given in this scenario. But there is no interest on interest. Okay. On your side also, the side also, because you know, you had, because you had given me interest, then I had earned interest, so you cannot claim. The simple interest at least is being uh, given for the uh, delayed uh, uh, refund of any amount which SSE is entitled for a refund. Uh, but generally, what happens practically is the officers unofficially take an undertaking that you will not claim a refund. Sorry, interest. And uh, say, you don't claim, no? I'll sanction immediately refund. So don't claim, no? So you want your next quarter refund is held with it. Now you have an apprehension. You have, uh, should I claim or not claim? If I claim, my next quarter re the refund will be held back. If I don't claim, I'm going to lose interest. So you are in quick fix. So, it is all the management for some, I have told many times, okay, how many refund applications are due? Sir, three or four. You have time at least one year. Don't ask now. Whatever the processes are there, let it get over one more, two more. After that you claim the interest for all of them together. In fact, uh, there are cases where the refunds have been sanctioned, interest have been sanctioned on the delayed refunds. So, very, uh, but it is very uh, tricky issue because the officers are personally reportable to such particular delayed interest. Okay. Uh, now it is faster. Service tax in excess of 3 months in GST is 60 days. Within 60 days, they don't sanction, they shall give an interest from that 61st day. But there is a provision that you know, in the, for counting the day, your document, all the documentation which is required to have been submitted, should have been submitted, something, conditions are attached. This is what I said uh, any authorities on record should be made responsible or accountable. Otherwise, this process doesn't. These are all what we expect from to get. Uh, I think what the last last lesser record. That's what we said there. Now you are instead of you furnishing all the shipping bill or uh, you know export invoices, now they are linking through a online process. So through the lesser documentation, you can speed up the processes. If you are to ex submit more documentation, then you will not, I mean, that delay will be automatic. If the refund any discretionary power is there for officers, they want it, such and such details, otherwise they will not uh, sanction the order. Suppose they are asking for EGM details, we are giving, providing VRC details, ultimate is money. So we are telling that VRC details is there why you are asking EGM, but uh, they are stick on EGM. Sir, uh, sir, until EGM is I'll tell uh, two aspects of it. Okay, one, you should go and read the rule or a notification. I'm, I mean, act, rule, notification, three things. Act, 
says sufficient documentary evidence to establish this is this. Rule comes out and says the documents again rule also do not say this document except for invoices. The notification also might not but as a practice they will be insisting that because they feel that is a full proof for their ascertaining that particular condition is fulfilled or not. For that they insist. But if you do not have, still legally you are entitled, but you have to convince because they would have given an instruction, circular says this you have to submit. But nevertheless, in fact in one of the notifications in the past, refund importation of SAD refund. That particular thing they said, when you are selling, you should declare on an invoice that I have not availed it, I am not passing on the benefit, you should not avail a uh, credit on this particular invoice, etc. When I am an importer who was not registered, I will not mention any tax on that particular thing. So the question of e-taking credit, not. So I had not put any declaration. The authorities denied me a refund saying that the conditions of this particular notification is not met. Conditions are stricter, so you will not be entitled for refund. Tribunals, including Lajeb and said, it's a non-imposable condition. Once I am not registered, the question of he passing on the credit and he taking credit does not arise. That being a case, mentioning of the fact has no relevance. The condition need not be is deemed to have been fulfilled. So, this will happen only at the higher form or through representation. Now that they are listening to any type of representation, if this is what is the bottleneck which is getting created, so you can always make a representation and on an exceptional basis they should be allowed and subject to the subsequent confirmation. You cannot say that, as I said, they start accepting. Exception will become rule, rule will become exception. So they do not want to dilute that particular process because they want to have this automation thing being there. Okay. Okay, lawmakers for acknowledge efficiency. Uh, basically, uh, whatever is the action presently happening is a very good. In fact, uh, I, yesterday I was in uh, Vishakapatnam. It is, I have to say, the businessmen have to be blamed. It is not only the government. <coughs> we met at least around uh, eight exporters who are exporting certain goods. Each, I mean, out of the seven, the minimum export is 800 crores. Item is exempted per se. They thought since their item is exempted, they are not eligible for refunds. And each one of them are entitled for refund clearly. And none of them even bother to look at it. So I am telling, we are only telling the government is not doing the thing. But even the businessmen also should get an So you know, where yesterday we enlightened them, we educated them that you are eligible, you have to file returns, in the returns you have to mention all these factors. So efficiencies has to be built in by the government. Also, it should be equally taken by the businessman and also. Improvise, they are doing a lot of effort, which we hope that is going to increase. Transparent, because online mechanism itself is a transparent, that you get to know, you can track your refund application, where it stands, all those things. Uh, I think obviously this will help in reducing the cost of business. It should be friendly, and easy for doing a business. With this, I have explained you the general concept of refund, principles of refund, what all the aspects needs to be kept in mind. Uh, and I hope that I have put a foundation for you to, for the next uh, sessions for you to understand when the schemes are being explained. Any questions? Documentary and evidence here, Maxwell, are going forward with the speaker. No, the actual refund mechanism processes, different type of things are going to be done later. This is only basics, that's all.
Yes, yes. So in one case, what has happened is the refund has been denied, saying that uh, the details are not matching to the shipping date. So in this case, uh, what can we do, sir? Now I think they have issued a uh, circular for amendment of the uh, that particular returns as well as the shipping bill details over there. So it is correct in our uh, from in the GST portal it is correct. They are telling that on the customs side when the CHA was uh, doing the export he would not have probably entered the correct thing. Uh, correct you should correct. catch hold of your CHA and ask him to correct. This is a positive correction. If there is an error, you have to correct the where the error has happened. You cannot say, even though it is from the government side, you have to move an application to the concerned authorities to ask them to rectify. You cannot, because the office is sanctioning a refund, they cannot bypass that system and sanction your refund. So, you have to go and correct or get it corrected through either customs or whatever it is and make the amendment changes in the system to get your refund process. So, to get it corrected, Say the export has happened to Chennai, Chennai port. So do we have to go to Chennai port or can yeah, your CHA agent would have assisted to the export, right? Yeah. You should tell your CHA agent to get corrected. Because he has enabled and the error has happened to him, so you should talk to him and that is how it is done. Generally, you can't expect you cannot go and meet the officers over there. Your through agent is what agent is appointed for that reason only. CHA is meant for that reason. He takes up all the responsibilities of yours in complying with the law and enabling and supporting you. Is your agent. Sir, one question. Is there any notification that 80% needs to give immediately? Uh, mm -hmm. 90%. 90%. Immediately once the application is filed. Is there the law itself? The law. Because we need to, so that we need to communicate. Law itself. You read the rule book is there. If deficiency is there in the documentary address. Without deficiency, then it's given. Uh, for continuation for his question, uh, for changing this in uh, customs website, is there a time? I think customs law rectification, I think it is two years if I am not wrong. But it is not an amendment to shipping bill. Shipping bill would have been correct. But the data being keyed in, because shipping bill physical document will be correct. As per my understanding, yeah. shipping bill physical document is correct. So there is no legality into it. It is merely correct. What I am taking his question, his situation. What is it was? Shipping bill number is correct. Physical copy is with him. He has keyed in the base on that in the whatever the returns, GST return. But why the data getting transmitted from the customs to GST? There, there is an error. Correct? Yeah, no. That was his situation. Yeah. You have different situation, you tell me the situation. Okay. Uh, the CHA is uh, not in my distinct responsibility. He is uh, appointed by the customs. Okay. And there is an error in uh, filing the shipping bill. And because of that, the GST amount mentioned that, the GST amount mentioned there is wrong. Okay. This particular amount differences, uh -huh. this was a number difference. Yours was, yours is an amount difference. Right. Amount difference is what I understand that they have clarified is, lowest of the delivery refund immediately. Other things you have to dissolve later. Sir, this is that it is calculated in the amount of the shipping What is the type of refund you are claiming, sir? For the, uh, service, uh, for the services which we have provided and it has turned balance. And we have paid already service tax on our... Uh, okay. Uh, you refer to section 142 subsection 5. Okay. This is dealt there. There, they do say, not withstanding any independent section 11, you are supposed to claim a refund under the old act with the old services department uh, officer, there they clearly say time limit is not applicable. But still, I caution you try to file within three years at least. From the date when we had made the payment to the department? The time limit is actually 
if you see the time limit in the 11B which was there, it was having a different different clauses. One of the clauses said, in case of a goods return, because the same is applied for services, the date of return of the goods is a starting point. Okay. So anyway, the time limit is not, but you can just note that section 142 subsection 5, which is there. I think one concept I think Anpuna reminded me is an inverted duty structure refund. I got a input tax credit at a higher rate, output tax at a lower rate. They will give me a refund of this particular extra pay. Again, it is a formula based. The formula is going to work like this. You have got a credit of say 80 rupees. You have got two products. It's a common input going in for two product. Product X, normal rate. Product Y, concessional rate. 40% concessional rate, 60% normal rate. 40% of his 80 rupees will be taken minus output tax balance will be given as refund. Example, for the 40% of this turnover, okay, your output tax liability is say coming whatever um, 10 lakh rupees. Now, 40% of this 80 lakh into sorry minus this 10 lakh you will be getting refund so this is how the refund mechanism works for the inverted duty structure now if you have exports accumulated exports refund so in such a scenario maybe you have to you have to go for both in some cases inverted duty structure to some extent where you are going for an on payment of tax because even if you pay taxes also, you cannot encash that. So if you are going with the payment of tax method, you may have to also go for an inverted duty structure refund along with the payment of tax for refund mechanism. Okay. Sir, in our case, sir, one question is there. Yes, sir. Actually, the re-import of our work was only, actually, we have taken the exemption section and our customs notification 46 for 2017. In this case, we have now yes, charged CVD. Actually, as per our customs, CVD is allowed, CVD is allowed, they are not charged. But here, even though they have charged the CVD and collected. Who has charged? Customs. Customs has asked you to pay? CVD. CVD. Yeah. Okay. So, we have taken that exemption, uh, this will not be a 46 bar 2017. Now, how can we go for refund? Because it is not submitable. I have to check that particular notification once again, sir. Uh, in, in principle, I doubt that CVD because uh, is applicable. If, you, if it is applicable, you have no choice in that amount gone because there is no transitional provision specifically built in for certain things. In fact, uh, I think Bombay High Court recently, three days back, dealt uh, with the situation. They say whenever these benefits are being given, it's uh, it is being given. When they are giving something, they can put any restriction. And these are special provision enabling it. It is not your de facto right. Once it is not your de facto right, something is being given. They may miss out something. Unless that specific provision lies, you cannot get automatically into GST. But you may examine uh, claiming of a refund under the old law if it is there under any provision, otherwise it will become a cost. This, uh, there are so many aspects that missed out in the transition. This is one of this may be one of such transition results. Sir, uh, sir, if it is we, uh, we have uh, export of some parts, distribution uh, parts, uh, four numbers. Sir, that uh, our customer will use that one, but the two numbers is rejected. So we have to play the IGST in the uh, at the time of the export. It returned to the return to back to me one numbers. So how it is can uh, uh, again I will uh, revert and return to our customers. How it is uh, re uh, refund for uh, IGST? You have paid IGST and claim refund? Yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, I told in my con my deliberation, receipt of money <coughs> is is not a criteria. Okay. okay. Export is completed once it was a customs and reaches, reaches that. So that part is concerned, it is over. 
Subsequent re-import is an independent transaction. Customs deals it separately. Subsequently, when you export, again, it deals separately. So in that situation, whatever initially you paid, you will be entered in for refund. It has nothing to do with but the... But that part is returned. I have to uh, refund. But that part is uh, again going to be sent to export. Okay. Doesn't matter. What the first export which had happened, yeah. that refund you have got, that transaction work. Subsequently, what comes in, import providers will deal with it. There's an exemption notification which says that any re-import of an exported goods subject to certain conditions, if you are not given benefit, you will not uh, pay any taxes, you will come in. Subsequently, you will re-export it. And re-export it, you can export it without payment of tax under IDOT. If you have a sufficient credit, you can also pay tax on that also and export it and claim refund of it. No problem. Yeah. I think uh, those are the topics not being covered. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Gopinath sir. Thanks sir. Before I conclude, I would like to thank Hidden uh, Academy uh, as well as each one of you uh, for this wonderful opportunity of mine. Thank you.